We have a guest in the studio and his name is Hassan Kanenje. He is a director of the Horn Inst International Institute for Strategic Studies. Good morning, Hassan. Good morning. Eric. Good to have you in the studio. Thank you. Good Did you know me. about Omenjo? Actually, yeah. I'm just learning yeah. this morning. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, what I was expecting is Semeji. Yeah, something like <laughs> Semeji. Semeji. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a revelation. I th thanks Omejo. for the education. Yes. Omejo. Omejo. <laughs> we have you in the studio and we uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Because this weekend we commemorate the anniversary of the... 14 Riverside Drive terrorist attack that took place on the 14th, on the 15th of January 2019, 15th and 16th. Uh, many people died, people lost their relatives, their loved ones, uh, businesses were affected, and it was just a dark moment. And we want then to look at what steps have been taken in the country by various actors, security, um, at the community level, civil society, in addressing violent extremism and also addressing terrorism in the country. So Asante Sana for joining us. First, let's hear about this Horn in International Institute of Strategic Studies. Who are those? Yeah, the Horn Institute is a research and policy think tank uh, that focuses on uh, the key thematic areas of defense and security. Uh, uh, terrorism and extremism, diplomacy and foreign relations uh, specifically. And uh, <coughs> it uh, works uh, primarily in 13 countries of Greater Horn of Africa region, but by and large our, our analysis and research actually covers uh, the entire continent to a large extent from Tangier to the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, but <coughs> the reason we primarily, first of all, focus on the region, especially 13 countries, is because of the commonalities that exist within uh, this stretch. Mm. Now, when it comes to the subject matter of the day, for instance, uh, as we speak, there is a long stretch of uh, terrorist networks from Cabo Delgado in Mozambique to Congo. And so that, uh, of course, is part of the reason that we cover the, the, the region we do, but mostly we work with the government, uh, uh, government agencies, uh, international organizations, uh, regional organizations such as EGAT and African Union, uh, communities, uh, civil societies, as well as the media. And in the, just last year, because of the nature of the work we do, and I think the credibility of it, we were ranked number 18 as a think tank to watch in the world uh, by the Global Think Tank Index. And so we are proud uh, to say we've been doing uh, you know, fairly good work, especially in this region. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> increasingly, uh, the Horn Institute has also become uh, the most go-to think tank by international, by local and international media, especially on matters on terrorism, and extremism, uh, security, defense, and diplomacy. Who consumes your information? The people who consume our information, of course, they're multi-layered. There are a number of levels. Uh, the primary consumers of information, of course, are policymakers. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary, of course, are the research institutions, think tanks, universities. Uh, thirdly and critically is the public, uh, because it's very important, number one, to enlighten the public, but also to assist in shaping policy, especially on critical matters that affect communities, affect nations, affect regions, and affect states. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just looking at the different things, I mean, it's interesting because you talk about the length and breadth of the continent, uh, looking at activities that may be happening, um, touching on terrorism throughout uh, the continent, whether uh, Africa is a receptor of some of these themes that come from outside bodies that we know of, whether it be Al-Qaeda or such, right? Yeah. Whether we're receptor sites or perpetrators from here. What have you seen is that you have pockets of units that operate here as kind of like branches of headquarters or are we seeing continent grown terrorism from what you've been able to to see over the years i think uh, initially uh, we were receptors mm -hmm. and uh, what has been existing largely were what are called franchises they, you know for instance they've been al-qaeda franchise across the continent. They've been ISIS franchise across the continent, manifesting themselves, of course, in in form of uh, groups such as the Al-Shabaab, mm -hmm. you know, such as uh, the uh, Boko Haram, you yes. know, as well as others. Yeah. 
uh, but increasingly uh, because of just I think the interconnectedness of our region mm -hmm. with what I call the primary source of the original terrorism, which is the Middle East, mm -hmm. we've also become the source. Mm -hmm. And so increasingly, we are having Africans uh, uh, actively get involved in foreign theaters of war. And whether it's in West Africa or in East Africa, including Kenya, mm. where uh, if hundreds of university students and other young people have actually joined Al-Shabaab mm -hmm. and ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes a concern. I think the perception initially was that this conflict was a foreign conflict and we were simply caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. But right now it is our conflict because it's our young men and women right now who are actively involved. Sure. And it's our pap, pap, uh, our citizens who are involved also at times in finance. Mm. So we can no longer say it is uh, a foreign thing. In yeah. fact, quite to the contrary, the Sahel and the Horn of Africa have become the next theater of terror, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the world right mm. now. It is very fertile. It ha promises potential for growth. And so it is up to us <laughs> to actually <laughs> Uh, Promises potential for growth. Yes. As a region or as a theater for terror? No, as a theater for terror, if nothing is done uh, because okay. uh, of uh, sometimes what we see as complacency. Mm. And to remember, Africans didn't re really look at themselves as being uh, perhaps uh, the originators of such ideologies. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, I remember in the 90s when, for instance, suicide missions were being undertaken by the Tamil Tigers, mm -hmm. uh, it looked very crazy. Yep. And so with the outbreak of the Intifada later on, of course, in the, in, 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 in the occupied territories in Palestine, th th this was seen as something perhaps for Arabs mm -hmm. and probably even other races, not exactly Africans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, even as we speak, uh, there was a massive attack uh, in in Somalia, you mm -hmm. know, suicide missions. Yeah. Sure. Of course, not to uh, to forget our own attack, you know, in Lam against our security forces. And so this has become our problem and mm. we're going to have to think about our own solutions mm. and our approaches on dealing with it. As with many other things, I think we see that this uh, then forms patterns, right? Yes. Um, uh, from previous times, whether you're dealing with some of these other bodies, um, from things that we've read and seen, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they have patterns of operation. So even if you're able to cut off this head, another one not even grows, but has been resident somewhere else. So the operations are able to continue. But what is very interesting to me is that the study of such has been done. And in order for, for you to study something and realize how they operate, that means you kind of know where they are and you know where their form of command is. So then it poses the question, why does it become so difficult then to be able to deal with it? I mean, you're saying, look, where we are now on the continent, if we do not deal with this, it's going to be something quite ugly in a very short period of time. But we've studied it so much so, I mean, we have institutions, entire institutions with branches who study these things to the detail. So w what poses as the difficulty and then being able to deal with with this? You know, the challenge with uh, international terrorism and the nature of the terror threat that we face, mm. it's like you hunting an octopus, uh, you're looking for the head. Mm. It seems to have, uh, you know, uh, to be moving in all directions. And <clears throat> that is why, you know, while a lot of effort has been done, and in this country in particular, uh, especially in countering violent extremism, uh, I think Kenya is one of actually the most uh, advanced countries when it comes to uh, employing soft power in countering you know, violent extremism. However, the challenge regionally and globally, it is increasingly there is no central command of mm -hmm. a lot of terror groups. Mm -hmm. And so these affiliates or some who have been inspired ideologically by perhaps uh, their mother uh, organizations, whether it's Al-Qaeda or ISIS, mm. they've developed the ability to be able to operate independently. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not to mention increasingly even some individuals, they self-radicalize because of easy access to content and literature that can be able to do that. And so that ability for independence and to be able to conduct their own things based on their own unique uh, uh, circumstances calls on us to be able to craft responses that actually reflect this uniqueness, mm -hmm. you know, because if we think we're fighting Al-Nusra or ISIS in Syria, 
uh, without understanding the local complexities or vulnerabilities that they may seek to exploit, mm. then it's going to be a challenge. So yes, I agree. They, we have institutions, we have uh, you know organizations that are dealing with this, but contrary to I think popular belief, sometimes you mm. know. T terrorists are not very stupid people. Right. Yeah, the enemy somehow always wants to be a step ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is why the only way to counter it effectively is for us to always try to be step a step ahead, ahead of them. Mm -hmm. uh, in the words of Sun Tzu, you know, he once said that a smart general is not the one who tries to outfight his enemy, he's the one who outthinks his enemy. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get into the business of outthinking. And that is why coordinating efforts. Uh, in CVE, being able to know that the, what the right hand is doing and the, what the right hand is doing, mm -hmm. they actually can be able to work together is critical, you know. And that is why we have uh, in a number of countries, including Kenya, organizations such as NCTC that actually tries to be able to coordinate efforts so that we do not fight in desperate fronts uh, without knowing what is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are able to define what the problem is to be able to address it because initially the problem was actually defining who our enemy is, mm -hmm. and how we should go about it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a two-pronged question. Yes. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, research does, well, the primary thing that research does, it, it seeks to answer a certain question. But researchers will tell you that in the process of trying to answer that question, you'll come across responses that you had never figured out before. That's correct. There's always a surprise waiting for you around the corner. Mm -hmm. So let me ask the first question. One, what would you say are the main causes of radicalization that leads to this problem that we're referring to as terrorism? Um, causes of radicalization. Yes, what brings about this situation where people yeah. mm -hmm. want to turn their lives and head in that direction and they see it as a just cause and they see it as something worthwhile? Radicalization in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. You can be <coughs> an economic radical because you want to bring about change. You can be a, a social radical, you know, because perhaps uh, you believe in social justice and you think the society is going the wrong direction and there's a lot of unfairness. You could be uh, a political radical. Uh, I think many and uh, I think, you know, probably all enough to know this. Most of us would, on our campus days, we were radicals. Uh, <laughs> But somehow we believe comrade. That, you know, mm. exactly com the comrades comrade. were radicals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're trying to believe in a new democratic dispensation however the type of radicalization that is bad is radicalization that leads into extremism mm -hmm. okay because at that point especially when that extremism becomes violent mm. the nature it becomes dangerous now a number of factors can lead people into getting radicalized one uh they can be radicalized by association. If you are hanging out around a group of people who are holding radical views, especially in this case of terrorism, against states or communities that you think they're not living up to your standards or somehow they're being unjust to you, mm. there's a way in which you're going to find yourself holding very radical or extreme views. Uh, two, there are processes that sometimes lead, you know, such as you, you know, national or local regional policies, for instance, that may lead to marginalization of persons, mm -hmm. alienation of communities. Uh, but sometimes increasingly, uh, certain conditions, you know, for instance, poverty, uh, or, so to speak, sometimes international climate, mm. that because of the affective bias that we tend to have people who actually believe in our let's say our faith or share our faith or share our race or share our color when we think they're being persecuted somehow we find a way uh, trying to associate ourselves with them that is the re it's the reason that created black for instance radical nationalism in the u.s mm. in the 20s 30s 40s and 50s if you listen to the speeches of, of malcolm x i think you're going to get that very clearly and so that's radical they challenge with what i call uh the current you know islamic related kind of radicalization it is the expropriation of scripture you know to advance certain political goals objectives in ways that is actually inimical and harmful 
to the modern state and to our constitutions as we know them. And so that becomes dangerous. So in so far as even those uh, uh, factors that contribute to our condition concerned, it directs an individual into a certain direction. So it's a, a process of acquiring you know, certain ideologies mm. that are actually <clears throat> going to go counter to the, what I call the, what is the mainstream. And so when you get radicalized, you start moving away from the mainstream. And the mainstream tends to be moderate. The mainstream tends to be uh, more, uh, what can I say, um, Accom more accommodating, more accommodating, mm -hmm. more tolerating. Mm -hmm. But when you start getting radicalized, you alienate yourself. And sometimes that alienation leads to alienation by others mm -hmm. as, as well at the same time. But this particular situation that we are discussing, it seems to be a growth industry. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not some domestic docile enterprise that just a few selected individuals go into. And it targets young people who are most susceptible to influence. Let me move to the second part of my question and why I'm asking it. <clears throat> there are social aspects that are born out of expectation. Somebody is young, they expect certain things to happen or certain things have happened, and as a result of that, their lives are what they are. And so the element of change that you speak of becomes a catalyzing force because there is this youthful exuberance that also accompanies conviction that these things that seem difficult can be done, and then a path that can be followed. But there, in my mind, there is a far more nefarious aspect to it the commercial. People who think in those terms and who bring about this ideology are not necessarily change agents. Not necessarily. They are people who have a far broader outlook toward life and they understand exactly what the commercial benefits or the benefits themselves can be. Now, the areas in the world where we have seen a growth, as you say, Mm -hmm. have been areas where people have been disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. They've probably been at war. They have felt that certain communities have oppressed them more than they have oppressed others. If we look at Kenya and we look at our youth who have been radicalized, it isn't even from one community. No. Mm -hmm. But the key agent in all these things is young people who don't seem to have anything else to do. Now the question comes. Mm -hmm. When people are called in, summoned, enticed. Is it, in your research, what have you found are the key components to the messaging that these young people are given that entices them to join? Because I don't think they're told, come, blow yourself up, and you will... I, I, I don't think that is the message. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, that's true. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it is true. I, I, I think if, if that was the message, it's going to be difficult to actually get people to join. No. Um, just like in the art of seduction, uh, <laughs> you know, everything has to be done, you know, with, with, with a strategy. Mm. And terrorists are very strategic in the way they approach. And I agree. A lot of one of the predisposing factors is the unmet expectations of a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And unmet ex expectations uh, leads to frustration. And I'm sure you're familiar with the frustration aggression hypothesis with Sigmund Freud. When people are frustrated, they tend to be aggressive. Now, so you get out of school, you don't have a job. Mm. Okay. Uh, perhaps sometimes you walk into an office and someone expects to, you know, you'll pay a bribe which you don't have. Right. And your family thinks you're too old, you need to get married, you don't even have money. Okay. Uh, you know, your neighbor started laughing at you that you might have gone to school, but, you know, you've just become useless. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is you look for an answer. Young people tend to look for an answer. And it's a human thing. When there are lots of issues going on around you, you want to look for an answer. The challenge is how terrorists succeed in that is they exploit those vulnerabilities. They simply, because politicians, 
they're going to tell you a lot of things, for instance. Uh, you attend forums, they're going to tell you a lot of things. But terrorists simplify solutions to your issues. Number one, they're going to tell you the source of your problems. Yeah. There could be a million of them, mm. but they'll tell you, you know, do you know the reason you are this and this and this way is because of Muga? <laughs> okay? Mm. And let me tell you, you see the, the car that Muga drives is because it's tall part of your land. Mm. The car, <laughs> you, you understand? And so, in the framing of it, they simplify it that now you actually know the source of your problem. Mm. Two, they provide you with, with a simple solution. They simplify solutions. And a solution could be get come, rid of Muga. join, yes, our movement so we can get rid of Muga. Mm. Sometimes you don't even know you'll actually end up in a suicide vest, mm. you know. And in fact, we are ready to send you $300, you know, as a down payment. And a lot of, you have been a lot of cases where these people have received money. And so you start actually believing this is going to work. Mm? Sometimes they start sharing with your content once they see you have an ability, mm. they start sharing your content that literally confirms your worst fears. And sometimes it is so subtle you can never even know. Mm. Mm. So <coughs> they keep indoctrinating you slowly and slowly until you actually become so radicalized without them ever asking you to become a radical. Mm. One professor at University of Nairobi once taught me that diplomacy is the art of making someone do your bidding and have them think it's the idea in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they're also very shrewd in diplomacy that sometimes you actually get yourself indoctrinated without realizing and deciding to take a mission to Somalia or wherever it is thinking you're going to be part of a larger goal, mm. something bigger than yourself, because it gives you meaning that you feel you're missing from the ground. You know, at home, no one is giving you answers. Mm. There have been young people who, you know, upon sometimes, you know, their repentance and maybe return, they talk about their only family situation and how broken it was. And this was the first thing that actually gave them hope, mm. you know. And so what should we do in those circumstances is right. we should be able to replace that mm. you know this is kenya's biggest conversation the situation room our guest is hassan kanenja he is the director of the horn international institute for strategic studies horn institute right yes thank you we are talking about uh, uh, preventing and countering violent extremism in kenya ahead of tomorrow's anniversary of the 14 riverside drive attack uh, this is the Dusit 2 uh, attack in Nairobi that took place on the 15th of January in 2019. Hassan, you did a good job of just taking us through the definitions and understanding radicalization and extremism. Let's do the other definition. Terrorism. Is there a standard definition of a terrorist? And I ask that knowing full well that in Ethiopia the government has declared a certain <laughs> group a terrorist organization and we keep hearing you know this one has been branded a terrorist organization is there a definition of terrorism yes there is uh while there's no universally agreed definition sometimes or most of the time depending on the political uh interests are at hand terrorism is the use of violence for political purposes you know simply defined mm -hmm. is employment of violence to achieve political causes and uh, uh, while sometimes states brand certain opposition groups terrorists, it does not necessarily uh, make them terrorists, at least internationally. It is not something that is consensus on. But increasingly, and even whether they're UN definitions and stuff like that, the kind of terrorism we face is one that actually employs for political purposes and mm -hmm. a lot of times is in challenges states and nations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, to, for, to suggest that perhaps, uh, you know, there are going to be too many definitions of terrorism, uh, a lot of times is a convenient excuse actually not to be able to deal with the problem at hand. But yeah, we do have some definitions and in Kenya we do have those definitions and that is all the pressure definition that we're using, especially in dealing with the problems that we face internally. So causing some disturbance and, and violence to achieve some political uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. That's mainly it. 
Yeah, so not, there are various groups. Not, not some disturbance, yeah. not just some disturbance. You uh -huh. know, uh, throwing stones on Mombasa Road is not you know, terrorist activity. Okay. Yes, but there is a deliberate calculated so the employment mm -hmm. of, of violence by mostly a non-state actor, mm -hmm. okay, against mostly the state itself. And, uh, of course, it operates on different levels. Y you know, um, a lot of times is is massive form of violence, mm. you know. And so today, for instance, if within the protests someone planted uh, a grenade, okay, or a petrol bomb, mm. you know, to uh, to blow up some institution or whatever it is, you know, that is a terror attack. Mm. You know, there's no way about it. You can't say, well, it was a protest that just became violent and mm. then I decided to start, you know, and it was one person, he's not linked to any other organization. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. You, if you could be one person, mm. it's still a terror activity. Mm. And I, th I think it's very, very uh, important that we actually understand that, that a terrorist is not just some turban wearing Afghani, mm. okay, you know, or an al Shababi. You know, you can be a terrorist even though you're as, as clean shaven as my brother here. Mm. Yes. Okay. So clearly what you said, and I'm going back to what you said initially, that what we're trying to do right now, whether it's government's institutions in partnership with government, then to be able to form policy uh, and then implementation thereafter, is to get rid of... But then you've also said that this is a belief. This is a belief that some people hold that they will be able to then radicalize, number one. Number two, then be able to influence government and politics mm -hmm. uh, in the way. That, so it's not something that you can, it sounds like it's not something that you can get rid of as easily as we say. Because essentially what you would be doing is upstaging or asking or cutting out mm -hmm. a belief which then makes it uh, a little bit more difficult. So what are ways right now, institutions or governments, are looking at how we can get rid of this bleed of terrorism, especially when you're dealing with uh, the softer side? And when I say softer side, I mean the intangible, things you cannot touch in terms of belief. I think, uh, you know, to say we can, you can, we can completely get rid of terrorism, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's would be an overstatement. We can reduce it to a point of, of irrelevance, mm -hmm. okay? Just like any other what about an accident, uh, even though they're numerous, as in it's not, it, it's not an existential threat to nations mm -hmm. or communities. Now, what I think our audience needs to understand is 90% of the work uh, are, that is done and should be done when it comes to countering violent extremism and terrorism has to be done by the public, mm -hmm. by the citizens. Mm -hmm. Government does 10% or less. Government is supposed to facilitate that process. Now, in recent years, if we have to talk about, for instance, uh, Kenya, a country, a nation, uh, the government has put in place mechanisms. In fact, its response uh, even just in the latest attack, as you see in Ducey, it was, of course, way more proved, I think, than previously because of the coordination. Mm -hmm. But also communities have been engaged. And uh, since, of course, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, that, of course, laid a foundation, uh, part of it, you know, for the NCTC that we have in terms of coordinating these events, the government has worked a lot more with communities, local communities in particular, and civil societies to actually ensure that this terror does not take root. Now, the challenge, I think, for Kenyan citizens, and I think the same applies to a lot of, of, uh, of our citizens on the continent, is um, there's a way in which they look at government as if they're separate from it. Mm. And so they, we rarely take ownership of government and we rarely think that we are actually the government because we don't ex government does not exist without us. These are the people who know their neighbors. These are the people who know the people they do business with. And if there is no cooperation and collaboration between, for instance, security agencies and citizens, trust me, the work of fighting terror is null and void. Mm. It's not going to get anywhere. Mm. You know, there is no single study, no single research, no single experience someone is going to share with you that is going to say the government won the war against terror. Sure. No. It's always the citizens who are going to win the war against terror. So practically, how do you pick it up? If we take Dusit, for example, and um, that the attack happened and then the perpetrators of the attack clearly were dealt with because, I mean, then they were they were killed. They were taken out. 
what happens there? Because we're looking now at a practical situation whereby we're saying that then this collaboration or this cooperation then between government, who is meant to facilitate, and then citizens who are meant to be active. What practically is supposed to happen? The world was watching. Does it happen? The attack happened. Lives were lost, right? Mm -hmm. Government comes in with combined forces, whether they were external forces in terms of uh, military from other partnering countries or whether it was internal defense forces, right? Mm -hmm. Day one, day two, the attack, things have been suspended. What then happens thereafter? What happens thereafter is what should be happening before even that. Mm. And now, one thing that is important, I think, for us to understand is... Um, Almost every single day, a terrorist is trying to do harm to us, okay? A terrorist is trying to penetrate uh, the Kenyan fabric, the Nigerian fabric, you know, the Ethiopian fabric. Mm -hmm. The challenge is uh, a lot of successes are registered both by security personnel and by citizens and communities who report this to the local chiefs, who report this to relevant agencies and those things are arrested. A lot of those heroes are never talked about. They're never known. They simply disappear in the forest. Mm -hmm. The ones who are successful in attacking, of course, are the ones we talk about. And sure. it always looks as if that 1% or 2 that mm -hmm. is successful is the one we tend actually to focus on and look as if, uh, you know, appear, make, make things appear as if actually no one is doing anything. Mm -hmm. And you start wondering, and how come those people did not do anything? How come security forces, you know, did, were not aware of this? How come the people who live in that area didn't say anything? There are a lot of good citizens who actually come forward uh, to say, hey, we're having very strange people here. How else do you think even, you know, government gets uh, access to information about people who are doing drugs, mm -hmm. about people who are doing smuggling? It's normally the neighbors. It's normally people of goodwill, you know. As Americans like to say, when you see something, say something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as simple as that. But the moment we stop saying anything because we are fearful, we are afraid, or we do not think we have a stake, that is actually when it takes root. And so whether you live on the border area, whether in Mandera or Moyale or Mombasa or in Nairobi, it is it's a collective effort and responsibility for us as citizens and for us as, mm -hmm. as citizens of the world you know, to ensure that when you have information, and there is a lot, frankly speaking, just, and just using the example of Kenya, one of the things that is always missing and one of the things I'm, I'm going to challenge even us in the media here is we need to be able to discuss more with regard to opportunities for citizens to actually work mm -hmm. with their own government in fighting terrorism. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that is not normally widely shared and in part because sometimes as we in the media we don't educate sometimes ourselves sufficiently to know how can we be able to play a role that can contribute to that. Now another challenge sometimes goes to the way we also uh, report these issues mm -hmm. and talk about them, whether as analysts, politicians, or even, you know, a media person. Mm. One of the things that terror thrives in is publicity. Okay. And anytime we give them a lot of room and mileage for what they have done or not done as a terrorist, it is something that actually they use in their videos for propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's something they spin, they're like, see, Muga is talking about us 24-7. Mm. It means we are very important. Mm. You know, look at that image is being shown of what we did, you know. And so if it's not, if you look at, for instance, the way the Western world covers things, it minimizes sure. their relevance mm. a lot. Some of those graphic images that sometimes we show as Kenyans, they're never shown mm -hmm. because they don't want to give them publicity and have them use, think they actually have some power, you know. Now, the stories of heroes, and I'm glad, hopefully, you know, we, on the eve of a Ducid attack, perhaps we can have some heroes uh, in the media, is going to be important because it can encourage other citizens to actually take that positive step in moving towards that. Terrorism is not a government problem. It is our problem mm. because I can guarantee you the reason why you go through hell, the airport, mm. is because of that. You know, the reason why you're frisked everywhere you go, including when you're coming here, mm. you know, it's because of terrorism. The reason why we can't travel as freely and actually enjoy and even grow as economies is because of terrorism. Mm. And all the way from Sahel, look at the damage that, for instance, Boko, Boko Haram has done to Nigeria. Yeah. You know, for all these years, you know, economically that runs into trillions of dollars, you know. 
And therefore, as citizens, we also have a responsibility, you know, to be able to actually contribute to that and look at how best can we be able to inform a public. But you can't inform what you do not know. You can only teach what you know. But by the same token, if, as you say, the responsibility and the burden uh, predominantly lies with the citizen, what then do you do with a situation where indeed the individuals and their groupings that could fall under the great labeling of terrorism or terrorists, and yet whatever mission or whatever grief or whatever the narrative is not considered negative or abhorrent to the citizens. Mm. You find there are people who actually support that view. They yeah. are not going to go out and do anything adverse, but they do not... It resonates with them. Yes, they don't have an issue with it. So they will not support what we may refer to as government efforts mm -hmm. to try mm -hmm. and reduce it. We were having that discussion here mm -hmm. the other day, mm -hmm. and we came to this understanding that without local support mm -hmm. and without accomplices locally, some of the things that we hear happening would certainly not happen. I agree. Uh, in fact, not some of the things. Most of the things we see happening without local uh, collaboration will not happen. Mm. And that is why the local involvement is very important. Now, it is true that some people don't find some of these things abhorrent. Mm. Okay. You see, as they say, uh, your freedom stops where my right begins. So you are free to say and do anything as long as it does not infringe, infringe on my rights. Now, as a citizen of a civilized country, there are certain things, of course, we know we cannot do. For instance, anywhere in the world, you cannot shout fire in a parked room, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And say, well, but it's, I, this is protected speech. I can <laughs> say whatever I want. Right. No. Or I just like, you know, shouting fire. Mm. No, you cannot do that. Now, knowing the gravity of the terror problem, for instance, then, of course, then there are things that we cannot mm -hmm. be able to. So we have to make effort to be able to convince even those in the community and local that it is in their best interest to actually be able to work collaboratively with others actors but that best interest as well i want to go back into the way we define terrorism mm -hmm. uh, and so you have got the state here and what the state is doing and what the state is not doing so you find that there are communities who are feeling completely uh, disenfranchised. They feel that their government of the day is not serving them. They feel that the state has actually neglected them. Successive governments have not addressed their issue. So they organize themselves, not to kill, but they organize themselves to rise up against what they call, they consider an oppressive regime or an oppressive state. Of course, the state immediately brands them terrorism, terrorist organization. Mm. Or the state immediately calls them rebels because of the way they were agitating. Look at what the ANC was, look at what the Ngoroko were doing. So you are going ahead in you know, organizing some sabotage operations here and there to sabotage state operations because you want to call their attention to your plight. But instead of them responding to what you're saying, they immediately brand you a terrorist group. Yeah, that is how correct. do we counter that? Because I think sometimes the, the government and the state, the government of the day is very quick to say this is a terrorist group and so let's crack down on them as a terrorist group. And then that pushes that organization to become more and more radical and more and more violent. Whereas their in intention was not that. As they say, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's hero. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that, uh, of course, Mandela was born in a terrorist. In fact, that designation, of course, was only lifted under the Obama administration all yep. these years. Uh, however, we also know, as students of history, that a lot of those designations were political. Were political because they meant to disenfranchise, for instance, majorities or minorities uh, from their legitimate rights. Now, when it comes to... Now, those were legitimate rights. Now, when it comes to, for instance, uh, the region that we live in, okay, mm. uh, we have, we've had people who've demanded uh, recognition. You know, we have communities in this country that feel dis in, in, in disenfranchised yeah. and they will want more representation, for instance, mm. as opposed to taking up arms. Mm -hmm. That is why how we're going to deal with Sabaot Land Defense Forces or MRC is going to be different from the way we're going to deal with, uh, 
you know, Tanga Tanga or whatever, or Azmi or movement that mm. says, well, we want more power in this region, or perhaps the Ogiek, uh, you know, community group that says, we want more representation because we are being marginalized. Yeah. The, t the challenge comes when these groups want to take up arms or employ violence against a state, an established state. Mm -hmm. You know, it is true that uh, especially Kenya, for instance, like many African countries, we mm. are in the process of building nation states. Most African states or nation states, we, we call them today, were actually nations that were pushed together forced together to become nation states mm -hmm. but nation state is a is a process these were completely different people my sister here comes from nigeria mm -hmm. you know northern nigeria was ruled differently sure from southern nigeria mm -hmm. but even within the south you know they have their own differences you know yep. the euro yoruba they're all proud with their own old oil kingdom mm -hmm. you know the Igbo have you know feel different you know the biafra war that of course was part of perceived marginalization mm. and so we were forced to be together and so we, somehow we have to find a way to coexist in this uh artificial creations that in fact president uhuru was talking about mm -hmm. in terms of borders mm. you know in south africa you know but that's now the reality that we have but that, the argument is yeah who defines how we coexist and how we have the conversations the people for example uh, even now in nigeria the biafra Yes. There are people who are coming up with the conversation. Let's go. Let's revisit that conversation. It was not about killing people. It was about seceding or having some or some sense of autonomy. The MEND, Movement for Emancipation of the Niger Delta. Yes. What are these that they are agitating for economic rights? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the government or the state responds to them with some such serious force that they are forced to take up arms themselves. They're stifled to the point whereby they take they up arms to protect, yes, themselves. protect themselves. Yes, uh, and I think that and has, then they are branded terrorists. Yes, yes, <laughs> that has been that has been a challenge with many states and especially when you have proto nationalist uh, groupings that are demanding more rights or more authority. A lot of our states have not really no, uh, started, found an appropriate way of actually dealing with them. But what is important for us to understand is the moment, whether it's in the United States or in Russia or in China, the moment a group takes up arms for whatever reason against the state, it becomes a rebel group. A non, it's a non-state actor against the state actor. Now, because of the sovereignty that we claim in international relations mm -hmm. and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, chances are you may, as a leader, you may end up killing your own people in masses, you know, million but uh, uh, he, historically, died. yes, people don't start with taking up arms. Yes, mm. they start with trying to dialogue. They're just agitating and saying, "Let's yes. talk." And they try and they try. And, and after a while, they figure. Wall, I so mean, the, yes. yeah. when you give the example of the ANC, I was thinking because it's a history that I've studied. They didn't start with an armed struggle. No, 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 no. Yes. They, they wanted to go the Gandhi way. Let, let, let's talk about this. They realize, you know, this talk isn't taking us anywhere. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> this discussion and the, this thing, it isn't taking us anywhere. It's a process that we see over and, and over, over and over and over again. That is true, actually. Yes. Uh, and then the dominant community, which in this case is the government, has the power to direct the narrative. Yeah. So suddenly, And the monopoly for violence. Exactly. For violence. Yes. Um, and so when there's a response to that violence, <laughs> terrorists. terrorists. Yeah. So the process of nation making mm -hmm. or state making is very complex. It is. Uh, yes. And it is true that Mandela tried to dialogue. You know, ANC just marked 100 years since its founding, you know, the other day. It's mm. one of the oldest African parties, you know. And the apartheid government established in 1948 was, of course, in no mode to allow black people to assume more power. Mm. So they were no more to <laughs> negotiate. Okay. However, the, the, the challenge that we face is not, not just for those who are fighting, but for those who are also trying to, for, for, to, to suppress those who are fighting, to mm. recognize that it is in the mutual interest of both parties to always talk. It's the same reason why, for instance, I think Kenya has been very active in mm. trying to help Ethiopians mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, discuss these issues instead of actually fighting. However, ultimately, I think it's going to be a responsibility for all of us, Indeed. especially in fighting the problem of terrorism, to learn that we have an agency and a stake in it, and that 
our voice does matter and our actions make a difference. Indeed. Hassan Asante Sana for joining us. Hassan Kanenje is the director at the Horn Institute. We've been talking about countering violent extremism, especially in the country and around the Horn of Africa and in the continent. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. We hope to have you again soon. And as we commemorate, um, this is how many years? 2019 to 2022? Three. Three. This is the third year. The third um, commemoration, the third anniversary of the Ducid D2 attacks on the 15th of January 2019. Let's remember those who were heroes on the day and let's also remember those who lost their lives. Asante Nisana. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.